Back in October of 1996, the first cards featuring the legendary 3DFX Voodoo graphics chipset were released. And although it wasn't the first 3D accelerator for gaming on the PC, it was absolutely revolutionary and it provided performance and image quality that was just never before experienced. The Voodoo completely transformed the world of 3D gaming on the PC overnight and it became incredibly popular. It was really the gold standard that cards would be compared to for quite some time. There were numerous competitors that wanted a piece of that pie though, and they certainly did try, but none could really come close to matching the Voodoo's smooth frame rates at 640x480, at least not early on. But by late 1997, the competition was beginning to heat up with cards like Nvidia's Riva 128 and the second generation rendition Verite hitting the market. It was definitely time for 3DFX to take that next step. So how do you possibly improve such an awesome and legendary card like the Voodoo? You don't just marginally improve it, and as you'll see the 2 in Voodoo 2, it's more than just a number. It's double the clock speed, double the memory, double the number of texture mapping units, and most interestingly of all, two cards can work together to give you double the performance. Well, maybe not quite, but we'll talk more about that. And all that extra memory and performance meant that 3D gaming beyond 640x480 was finally a reality. And in February of 1998, just a couple of months after the very popular Quake 2 was released, the highly anticipated Voodoo 2 was unleashed to the masses. And once again, 3D gaming was taken to the next level. So in my hands here is the legendary 3DFX Voodoo 2. And like the original Voodoo, it's a dedicated 3D only accelerator card. And because there's no 2D functionality provided, a second video card is still needed in the system for 2D graphics purposes. And this was really the last card from 3DFX that didn't include this. Like the original, the Voodoo 2 is also a multi-chip solution, but with three chips on the card instead of two. So the chip at the bottom here is the frame buffer processor. And this handles all of the geometry and general 3D processing duties. And if you look at the chip's model number, it ends with CK and the 3DFX engineers nicknamed it Chuck, as in Chuck Norris, if I'm not mistaken. But what's quite different about the Voodoo 2 compared to the original is that it has two texture mapping units instead of just one. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as TMUs. These chips actually end with BE in the model number and were affectionately named Bruce by the 3DFX engineers after the famous Bruce Lee. So I think you can see a trend developing here. But a TMU is responsible for retrieving textures from the card's memory, doing filtering, mit mapping, and things like that. And having two TMUs working together can greatly improve the card's overall performance. It did require game support for dual texture layers though to take advantage of it, but as far as I know, most of the big titles, including Quake 2, Unreal, and quite a few others did support this, thankfully. 3DFX actually released two different versions of this card, and the one I have here is the full 12 megabyte model, but there was also a cheaper 8 meg model released as well. And like the original Voodoo, the memory is split between the frame buffer and the texture mapping units. Both the 8 and the 12 meg model have 4 megabytes dedicated for frame buffer purposes, and the rest is split up between the two texture mapping units. So you've got 2 megabytes for each TMU with the 8 meg card, and 4 megabytes for each with the 12 meg card. Like the original Voodoo, none of this memory is shared. It's, it's connected directly to their associated Chuck or Bruce chip on a dedicated bus. And you can identify the purpose of each memory chip by where it is roughly on the PCB. They tend to be directly to the right of what they're connected to. So these four chips up here would be for this TMU, these four here for this TMU, and the four at the bottom would be for the frame buffer. But there's more on the back of the card as well. Oof, this thing's a little dusty. I do have to get it cleaned up here. But um, these four chips at the bottom, you're gonna find on all of the models, and these are connected to the frame buffer that's on the reverse side of the card. But these uh, four up here and these four up here are for the uh, 12 meg card only for um, TMU purposes. So um, on the eight meg card, the PCB is basically the same. You're going to have empty locations here with uh, solder pads in place. And if you did feel so inclined, you could actually solder on additional memory chips to convert an 8 meg card into a 12 meg card, something for a future video, I think. And because the Voodoo 2 has twice the frame buffer memory that the original did, it can support an 800 by 600 resolution at 16-bit color. This was really the next big step up in image quality that everyone was just really excited about. 640 by 480 was already a huge improvement over 320 by 200 but 800 by 600 was something people only dreamt about a couple of years earlier. 
and not only could it support 800 by 600, it could run most games very smoothly at that resolution too, and this was really the key. The original Voodoo wasn't clocked terribly high at only 50 MHz for the chipset and memory, but on the Voodoo 2 they were able to increase that to 90 MHz, almost twice that of the original. And in fact, most of the Voodoo 2 cards I've seen included 25 nanosecond EDO memory that's rated for 100 MHz operation, which could potentially give you some extra headroom. But it wouldn't be a true look at the Voodoo 2 with just a single card, would it? And that's why I've got a second 12 megabyte card here to use for SLI purposes. But before I continue, I just wanted to give a huge thank you to Alexander from Germany, who was kind enough to send me his Orchid Righteous 3D2. Alexander was the original owner of this card from back in the late 90s, and he enjoyed many years of gaming on it. He told me that although he got rid of most of his old computer gear, he just never could quite bring himself to get rid of his prized Voodoo 2. But he really hated just seeing it there sitting in storage, and he really wanted this special card to serve a purpose again. So here it is, almost 25 years later, ready to rock some serious 3D once again. Also, on a side note, I'm very thankful it arrived here in one piece. I have no idea what happened, but I think at some point the box probably fell in the ocean, got fished out, and then probably run over by a truck or two. I've never seen a box arrive so beat up before. But thankfully, Alexander put tons of packaging and uh, materials inside the box, and the card was perfectly fine. So thank you again, Alexander. I really appreciate it. And I promise this card will be well cared for and put to good use. So back to SLI, 3DFX was really the pioneer of multi-card gaming. And many people don't realize it, but the original Voodoo graphics chipset did indeed have SLI capabilities. They just didn't implement it in the consumer cards for some reason. But there are arcade systems out there based on that chipset where it was actually used. So SLI stands for Scan Line Interleaving, and when I talk about scan lines, I'm not talking about, you know, a single horizontal line drawn by a CRT. Basically, for every frame, it's broken up into numerous horizontal stripes for processing purposes. And uh, this was even done with a single card too, not just in SLI mode, because it's just part of the way the frame buffer and the TMUs operate. But with two cards in SLI mode, the scan lines are basically distributed. The odd lines go to the first card and the even lines go to the second. And each card can process and texture those lines simultaneously, providing a pretty significant performance boost in some cases. And for this to work properly, the two cards needed to be able to stay synchronized and they uses, used a dedicated SLI connector at the top of the card for this purpose. It looks a lot like a 36-pin uh, floppy uh, connection here, and if I'm not mistaken, all Voodoo 2 cards included an SLI cable in the box. If you don't have an SLI cable, there are ways to construct one yourself, uh, using a floppy cable actually. Or you can buy one of these nifty little uh, PCB based ones here. There's single and dual slot versions of this. Uh, I picked this up from Serta Shop, and I'll put a link in the description if you'd like to add some flair to your 3DFX uh, SLI setup here. So one of the best bonus features of SLI, if you, if you will, is the fact that the frame buffer memory is essentially combined on the two cards to give you a whopping 8 megabytes. And that's enough memory to officially support a 1024 by 768 resolution, something a single card cannot do. And with the performance boost from running two cards and depending on the game, this could actually be pretty smooth too. One problem with SLI though is that you really needed two identical or at least very similar cards for it to work. Cards from different vendors or an older revision card connected to a newer one may not always work. And you cannot combine an 8 meg card and a 12 meg card either, which uh, could be a problem depending on what you're able to find out there. Thankfully, these two that I have here, even though they're not from the same vendor, they are similar enough to work just fine in SLI mode. CPU scaling can also be a big problem too when you have that much 3D power on tap. Most people in 1998 were still running, you know, Pentium or Pentium MMX chips and maybe an early Pentium 2 if you were lucky, but to really take advantage of SLI, you needed a fast CPU, potentially increasing the cost of an already expensive gaming system. Phil from Phil's Computer Lab did a really in-depth analysis of Voodoo 2 and SLI scaling, and he tested with everything from a Pentium 100 all the way up to a 1.4 GHz Pentium 3. And the frame rate improvements can be pretty drastic, that's for sure. I'll include a link uh, to his great document in the description if you'd like to take a look. But hey, that didn't stop people. I never owned a Voodoo 2 back in the day. I went straight from my original Voodoo to a Voodoo 3, which was a big step up for sure. But in 1998, I clearly remember reading about the Voodoo 2 and thinking just how amazing it would be to experience games at 800 by 600, especially Quake 2. 
All right, so enough about the Voodoo 2. Let's talk about testing. So I'm using an AMD K63 400 megahertz in this system here, and this is a SuperSocket 7 Epox MVP3 G2. Uh, it's about a year newer than the Voodoo 2, but it's definitely something people still would have used uh, these cards with back then. But just keep in mind that much higher frame rates would definitely be possible with a faster CPU, but that's not really my goal here. For 2D duties, yeah, you can't really see it, but there's a Matrox Productiva G100 card back here, which is a card I just recently repaired. And I'll put a link in the description of that video if you'd like to check it out. But Matrox cards like this one were a perfect match for the Voodoo 2. They weren't really known for great 3D acceleration, but they had fantastic analog video quality. And when you're using a pass-through cable, you know, it really does degrade the signal quality a little bit. So to have a really sharp image source, it does uh, help to mitigate this a little bit. For sound, I'm using the very venerable Sound Blaster Live PCI, which was a very popular card that was out around that time. And I'm also going to be using Windows 98 Second Edition, which is installed on a 4 gigabyte uh, compact flash card here. For drivers, I'm using the latest 3.02 reference ones released by 3DFX back in 2000, but there are some newer community-created driver packages out there, including the very popular Fast Voodoo 2, which can provide a pretty substantial performance boost, and it can even help with compatibility with newer games too, and I'm going to do some tests with both the Fast Voodoo 2 drivers, as well as the reference ones, to see what kind of a performance difference we can see. All right, so onto some performance benchmarks. Uh, these are by no means exhaustive, but really I just wanted to answer two very important questions. First, how much of an improvement was the Voodoo 2 over the original? And second, what kind of performance scaling do we see when we start using SLI? So let's, uh, let's get to it. So let's start with the trusty old GL Quake, which is one of my all-time favorite games. I wanted to include it here because unlike some of the newer ones, it's not so CPU limited and it really lets the Voodoo 2 stretch its legs a bit. And all I can say is, wow, what a huge improvement over the original Voodoo. From 36.5 to 107 frames per second, that's almost three times the performance. And if the resolution is increased to 800 by 600, we're still seeing almost twice the frame rate of the original. That's quite an achievement. SLI also provided a really healthy frame rate increase in this game. It's not quite so drastic at 640 by 480, but at 800 by 600, we're seeing a 72% increase, which is not bad at all. And at 1024 by 768, which is only possible with two cards, the frame rate is still higher than a single card at 800 by 600. Next up is Quake 2, and again, we see a huge improvement over the original Voodoo at 640 by 480 almost three times the frame rate again, and even at 800 by 600, it's more than twice as fast. But when it comes to SLI this time, we see a very different picture here, and that's because we're getting very CPU bottlenecked at this point. At 640 by 480, there's almost no improvement at all with SLI, and there's only a small 25% increase at 800 by 600. But even so, it's still pretty incredible to see that 60 frames per second is possible in a game like Quake 2 at 1024 by 768 in 1998. Well, I guess 1999 if you consider when the CPU is released, but yeah, just really amazing. And last is Incoming by Rage Software, released in 1998. Again, we see a very similar pattern to what we observed with Quake 2 here. We get a pretty big gain over the original Voodoo, but again, we're just very CPU limited here. Nonetheless, with SLI, we still manage about a 50% improvement at 800 by 600, which really isn't bad. And one last thing I wanted to see was what kind of performance improvement we can see with the newer Fast Voodoo 2 drivers over the reference ones. I purposely used GL Quake here again because I didn't want to be too CPU limited. And across the board we see a 2 to 3 frame per second improvement. Really not bad for a simple driver update. But there is more to this custom driver than just better performance, but I'll have to save that discussion for a future video I think. Anyway, I didn't want to get too carried away in benchmarks for this video, but I did want to showcase some of the classic 3D games from this era. So let's have a look at some of the best that 1998 had to offer. Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated train is provided for the security and convenience of the Black Mesa Research Facility personnel. The time is 8.47 a.m. Current topside temperature is 93 degrees, with an estimated high of 105. The Black Mesa compound is maintained at a pleasant 68 degrees at all times. 
They're waiting for you, Gordon, in the test chamber. Are you running those right. tunneling lattice calculations again? It's about to go critical. It's formed that the sample is ready, Gordon. It should be coming up to you anyway. Look to the delivery system for your specimen. So there you have it. Was the Voodoo 2 worthy of taking the crown from its predecessor? Yes, indeed. I think we can safely say this was an incredible card at the time. Two to three times the frame rates of the original Voodoo, higher resolutions, and just an incredible amount of 3D processing power with two cards in SLI. It's 
It was a very exciting time in the world of 3D gaming, and cards like the Voodoo 2 just really allowed game developers to go to that next level. So that's it for today, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see some more retro content like this. Also be sure to check the description below for links and other useful information, how to find me on Twitter, and for a link to my blog. Thanks again for watching.